have, I'm a little nervous, so I will start with anecdote. Okay. Uh, it's December 15, 2010, and you are meeting a strange guy on the street, and he offers you a bet. And he says, I'll let you look in a crystal ball, and the crystal ball will tell you how the 2011 will look. But there is one condition. You need to go to the BBC studio and tell to this guy and to the rest of the world what have you seen in a crystal ball. And because, of course, curiosity kills a cat, you accept. Next thing you know, you are sitting in a lovely, shiny BBC studio, and you are telling the story. And the story is as follows. Before the end of the 2011, Ben Ali of Tunisia and Mubarak in Egypt would be down. Saleh of Yemen would be on his leave. Assad of Syria seriously challenged. Muammar al-Gaddafi and Osama bin Laden would be dead. And Ratko Mladic would be in Hague. This is going to be one of the worst year for bad guys ever. <laughs> now, the, you know, the anchor gives you a strange look in the eye, but you still continue. And on the top of it, you'll have hundreds of thousands of young Greeks and Spanish people and even the loan donors and Americans struggling for the social justice all across the Europe and the world, saying that they got their inspiration from young Arabs. OK, this was enough. Two big guys in white appear in a TV studio. You get a funny shirt. You are taken to the nearest mental institution. <laughs> well, what we are trying to look upon, the thing is that, yes, this was 2011. Yes, this was really what happened. So what we really tried to discover is what is this thing, what is this power behind the very bad year for bad guys? And there is a name for it, and we tried to define it. We traveled throughout the world. After being involved in Serbian movement in, as a young revolutionary, I accept stop being young, formed an organization called Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, and I have the best world, job in the world. I travel around the world, try to teach people how to be free. And we work with people from 46 different countries trying to understand what is really making this social revolutions possible. And there is a name for it. And the name is people power. And to define the people power really is just to say that, you know, once the people decide not to obey, rulers cannot rule. So now we need to look into what really makes these revolutions happen. And wherever you look across the globe, now it is already taken by the global media, and you want to look at the Egypt, you want to look at the Arab Spring, you want to look to the rest of the Europe. You don't want to forget places like Zimbabwe. You don't want to forget the places like Burma, where do you have the opening. And you look at this thing and said, is this really a force more powerful? And the answer is clear. There is a great study done by two young American academics, Maria Steff and Erika Chenovet, they examined 323 cases of violent, nonviolent revolutions from 19,000 to 2006. Guess what? By violent struggle, you have only 26% of chances for success. By nonviolent struggle, it is 53. So advice to the people in the places like Syria is, the moment you take weapons, you cut your chances by half. Even better, as the people on the stage before me said, they were examining into what comes next. And they were intersecting the society's five year after the violent and nonviolent campaigns with one simple question. Is there a durable democracy? Results are shocking. You have 4% of chances ending up in durable democracy if your change is made by violent means, compared to 42% of chances ending up in democracy through the nonviolent struggle. Why? It's a popular process. The people participate. And once people become the shareholder of the change, it's very difficult to put the spirit back in a bottle. So those who are very eager to criticize Egypt and what is happening there, don't forget. Once the spirit is released from the bottle, it's very difficult to put it back in a bottle because nonviolent struggle really changes the way the people see themselves. We were also looking at the principles and say, OK, what do you really need to win in nonviolent struggle? And examining so many different cases, so many different religions, so many different mentalities, we came to the very short list of three things. 
You can't win without the unity, meaning unity of purpose, unity within the organization. You can't win without a strategy. There is no such thing as a successful and spontaneous nonviolent revolution. You need strategy, you need to plan, you're all the way back through. And the last but not of least importance, you need nonviolent discipline. Because you can have 100,000 people on a peaceful march, standing for the biggest values of this world, and then you can have two drunk guys or agent provocateurs whatsoever throwing stones. Guess what? And who will be on the cover page of tomorrow's newspaper? These two guys. So planning and nonviolent discipline are critical in achieving a successful social movement. Now, there is this line of sociologists who are telling that the real revolutionaries should be serious because the revolution is serious business. And you can hear all of the TV analysts talking about the conditions. You need as much educated people to have a successful revolution. You need uh, internet penetration. You need demographic distribution. But somehow they're missing the emotions. And what we've learned working with people from throughout the globe is that this is this tiny balance between fear, which is the air dictators breathe, and enthusiasm. And if enthusiasm goes up and you see people making jokes with the police instead of being afraid of the police, then you have a game changer. And within this game changer, there is a great role of humor. So this is a nice time to introduce the new term in the world's revolution, which is called loftivism. We know about the clicktivism, hacktivism. We need to talk about the loftivism. Because it is humor which has a tremendous role in melting fear, building the morale of your troops, because this is how your movement really becomes cool and everybody wants to join. And there is something with the dictators and humor. They can't stand being mocked. Spending so much time watching their face on the TV and on billboards, they start taking themselves too seriously. And then there is a bunch of these crazy guys making fun of themselves. 999, we had this big barrel in Serbia, just a small group of activists. There was Milosevic's face painted on it, the hole on the top. You go there, you put a coin in, you buy yourself a right to <clears throat> hit the guy with a baseball bat. And there is a boom, big sound. 200 downtown shoppers standing in the line for their chance <laughs> to hit Mr. President. We went out drinking espresso, so guess what? The police arrives, and they don't know what to do. We are not there to be arrested. No sense in arresting shoppers. And you can bet they've done the most stupid things. They arrested the barrel. And now this picture of the two policemen drugging the barrel into the police car was the best opportunity for photo reporters. Everybody got the cover page. You want to see more of it? Two months ago, in anti election fraud protests in remote town of Barnaul, Siberia. The bunch of very inventive young people came out with the idea that because they can't protest, toys maybe can. <laughs> so they came out with a lovely toy protest against the election fraud. And because the police was a bit upset, they needed to file a request for this protest. And guess what? The government banned it. The government officially banned protests of 100 Kinder Surprise toy, 100 Lego people, 20 model soldiers, 10 toy cars, because they're not citizens of Russia. <laughs> I would die to have this piece of paper. So next time, they'll probably need to work on a toy passport or something like that. So where do we go from this? Of course, His Majesty Internet, we are on a Google conference. So many titles, Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution. That is important because it makes things faster and cheaper and puts a huge price tag on the state-sponsored violence. It's also a powerful tool for educating people. 17,000 downloads of our book from the internet in June 2009 from Iran only. Compare it to the idea of distributing these books, and you have a very, very good idea. But This don't mix tools with substance. These revolutions and struggles are done in the real world and in the streets. So don't get lured into just by clicking something, you've saved your soul. Things need to be done properly and need to be done on the street. So at the end of this process, where do we go from now? 
are the brave men and women of the Arab world so successful in replacing and challenging their harsh dictators find their courage, strategy, and unity to do the less sexy but equally important part of building up democracy? It's a question, million dollar question. And then what will happen with what started as Arab Spring, spread it to Mediterranean summer, the places like Greece and Italy and Spain, all the way across the ocean to occupy Wall Street. So will these guys struggling under the banner of 99% find the answer to the questions what they want instead of just coming out with the endless list of what they don't want? Will they find their courage? Will they find their strategy to change the world? I don't know the answer to this question. But what 2011 really taught us is a big lesson. Not only that affirmed the idea of the people power, but gave a lesson to the people like me, people like you. People around the globe with good intentions, good connections, maybe some money, maybe some knowledge to share. It is probably the best world's investment into how to educate these people to wage their struggle. Because you can train 80 people in nonviolent struggle for the price of one gun. And this is exactly where we need to think about. How can we help these people? And what is this message we can send to the world to enforce people power? Because this is how we can contribute our little share in making this world a better place. Thank you very much. Proud to be with you.